everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our webinar will begin shortly. We'll just give everyone a moment to log on. And as we have you all joining, I just want to say a reminder that the webinar is going to be recorded and we will send you a copy within the next few days. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you again for joining us for today's webinar entitled Get Off the Red List, Your Guide to FDA Detention. My name is Amanda Trujillo, Marketing Communication Specialist for Mary Unrich Sciences and I will serve as today's moderator. So on today's agenda, we have some housekeeping reminders, our presentation, our presenter introduction, um, a polling question for our audience, and then followed by today's presentation focusing on FDA detention. Um, and then of course, a Q&A session at the end. So as we get started and throughout today's webinar, we will be collecting your questions to ask our expert at the end during our Q&A session. So feel free to submit your questions through the um, GoToWebinar control panel at any point during the presentation. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can uh, during that session, but if we don't answer or don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll definitely follow up with you um, after the webinar. And then again, the webinar is going to be recorded or is being recorded now, and you'll receive a copy of the presentation uh, within the next day or two. So on to today's webinar. Um, our participants today will gain a deeper understanding of what can trigger an FDA detention, which industries are impacted the most, what it takes to get your product out of detention, and how experts, how our experts can help you uh, work with the FDA to help. Um, detentions can result in delays in market, increased expenses in warehouse storage, and frustrated buyers with orders that fall short of expectation and delivery. Um, this can be costly in both reputation and dollars. Um, so we hope that you leave this webinar with the tools and knowledge you'll need in case you ever go through an FDA detention. And to better equip you with that knowledge, we have our presenter here with us today, Annie Hughes, a Business Development Manager for FDA Detention Services and International Projects. Um, Annie, thank you for joining us here today. Um, why don't you let the audience know a little bit about yourself? Yes, hi, I wanna thank everybody for joining today. I hope you find this session to be um, informative, valuable, um, so who am I? Um, I am the Business Development Manager at Mary U Nutra Sciences. Um, I received my bachelor's and master's degree uh, from the University of Florida here in Gainesville uh, in agricultural economics. I began my career uh, in the food industry with safety and testing at ABC Research Labs, which was based in Gainesville, Florida. It was one, one laboratory. Um, and when I was there, I was the business development specialist and I specialized in produce, seafood, nuts, grains, animal feed, and spice industries. So it that uh, position really gave me a view into the unique challenges that are presented um, to a wide array of industries. Um, a year later, I was promoted to the business development director and I oversaw international trade and FDA detentions. So about 10 years ago is when I started the, the world of FDA detentions and what it is. So it's it's been a, um, every day is a learning experience with the FDA, and I hope to pass on a lot of this knowledge to you in the presentation today. Um, in April 2015, Mary U Nutra Sciences actually acquired ABC Research Labs. One of the many reasons that they acquired us was for our focus in FDA detention program. Um, so here we are today. So thank you everyone for joining. Thanks, Annie. And again, thank you so much for uh, being our presenter today. We look forward to your presentation. Um, at this moment, we'd like to move on to a quick polling question before we get into the presentation. So you should be seeing a polling question come up on your screen. And our question today is, have you experienced FDA detentions in the past? Um, so go ahead, take a moment to get your response in. So we have yes, we have 
been frequently and I'm here to learn more. Yes, we have been frequently and have had poor experiences. No, it seems like a nightmare and I don't know what to do. No, I have never had a detention, but I want to be prepared. Uh, let's go ahead, just take a couple minutes and a couple moments to go ahead and click on the answer to the master's via facilities profile. All right, so I see some votes coming in. So we want a few more seconds before I close the poll. All right. All right, so let's look at these results. So have you experienced FDA detentions in the past? Um, looks like 57% of our audience has said no, they have never had a detention, but they want to be prepared. 28% um, of our audience says yes, they have them frequently, and I'm here to learn more. 10% say yes, we've had them frequently and have had poor experiences. 5% said no, it seems like a nightmare and I don't know what to do. Um, so, Andy, did these um, results kind of surprise you or anything stick out to you? Uh, no, it's it's probably about expected. Um, it's what we typically see in the industry. So I would say that that's probably spot on. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating in our poll today. I will go ahead and hand it over to Annie for her presentation now. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining again. Um, so I, I wish this could be more interactive, um, but since we're in the format of a webinar, it's, it's just going to be a lot of me talking. But please, as we go along, if you come up with questions um, pertaining to a particular slide, please, please click into the um, GoToWebinar chat box, enter in your question, and uh, I'll hope to address most of them at the end of this presentation. Um, so just to give a little bit of a background on Mary U Nutrisciences, for those of you that may not be familiar with us, um, we do offer 360 degree solutions. So we're not just a food testing lab with just micro and chemistry capabilities. We do a lot more. Um, we offer these programs to enhance your programs to support better food for a better world. And we do it by providing food safety, quality and sustainability solutions by combining this complete suite of services that we offer um, at every stage of the food value chain from farm to fork. So whether you're developing a product um, sourcing products um, for your sourcing ingredients for your final product. Um, we offer subscription services with, with topics like limit detectors so you can determine what pesticide residue limits might be out there for specific countries um, that you'll be exporting to or, or sourcing ingredients to import to the United States. We have consulting group um, to help you shelf life studies, label compliance, um, for FDA regulations and other countries. So again, if you're exporting, so it's not just importing. And then one of these solutions, obviously, is going to be FDA detention resolution, which is why we're here today. So what is an FDA detention? So Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act gives the authority uh, to the FDA to detain a shipment of goods if they suspect that it violates or is not in compliance with the law. Uh, the FDA, with this act, is also allowed to refuse admission of imported products to the US um, for a lot of reasons, including if the product appears to be adulterated or misbranded. FDA works with Customs and Border Protection to prevent the importation of adulterated, misbranded, or otherwise violative products into the country. Um, so this act gives the authority to the FDA to review, examine, and collect samples from these shipments that come into the US. FDA can collect their own samples, for FDA lab analysis, they can do this randomly. They can do it if they suspect there's a violation. Um, they can also stop and hold uh, shipments without physical examination, meaning they don't have to physically look at the goods that are coming in to, to be suspicious that there's a reason. They can just do it without looking, and this is where a third-party lab would come into play. Um, so why do products get detained? Um, again, this goes back to the Federal Food and Cosmetic Act, but product will be detained if the FDA has information that suggests um, future violations, sorry, future shipments may be in violation. It could be that there's a historical um, information that a product, a manufacturer, shipper, or even an importer has been in violation in the past. It could be a uh, grower, geographic area or specific country that has shown to have violations in the past. Could be product just being held under insanitary conditions. 
It could be that FDA sampled and collected um, collected samples and tested them on their own and discovered a violation, and that would put them on a published import alert list if FDA did find proof the product had been in violation. So what is an import alert? Because we mentioned that in the previous slide. So an import alert is published on the FDA's website. It provides information, including the reason for the alert and the list of suppliers that will be on a red or green list. And we'll dive more into red and green list uh, during this presentation. You can see an example from the FDA's website, and this is available to everybody, where you can break um, FDA entries. You can search by commodity, by country, uh, reason for detention. So this one was sorted for vegetables, vegetable products, and it shows you a list of import alert numbers assigned for a specific reason. So 9905 is uh, detention without physical examination, meaning FDA does not need to actually physically look at these products or examine them. Um, this one's for raw agricultural products uh, under suspicion of pesticides. So you can dive into each of these import alerts. So if you were to click on one, uh, this is 9919, which is for salmonella. That specific import alert, when you click into it, gives you information that's important. You can see the date of the update, update, which is called the published date. In this case, it's November 21st, 2022. So that's going to be when the most recent update or change was made. Typically, it's adding or removing somebody from a red list, um, or they've modified a reason for alert. This also includes information on uh, guidance from the FDA and the compliance officers. It's guidance on how they can charge entries that are coming into the country, gives reason for the alert, why this even happened in the first place, why the FDA had suspicion in this case um, for, for foods coming in with uh, contamination of salmonella. It will also go through and show you red and green lists specific to each of those import alerts. So a red list, what is that? That is a list of firms and their products that are subject to detention without physical examination under a specific import alert. So these are, are companies that have been known to have a violation or have a high suspicion of having a violation. And this is, again, this is all published on FDA's website. So you can actually dig into these import alerts and look for possibly a manufacturer that you're looking to source ingredients from um, from overseas. You can search within each of these to see if that manufacturer might be listed. Um, the red list, an example here, there's two specific countries. They're all sorted by country, so it's fairly easy to maneuver their site. Um, in this case, you can see that in Bolivia, this particular company was added to the list uh, September 16th of 2009. The specific product of concern was cumin, and it is for salmonella. So in theory, any shipment from this particular manufacturer, if they're bringing in cumin, it will most likely be placed on automatic detention um, because FDA does have this published. Now, if the same company were to bring in cinnamon, it is not. it is less likely it would be automatically detained because Cinnamon is not specifically listed under this import alert. Um, so to be added to this red list, it's, it's a specific product, manufacturer, shipper, importer that's had a violation or has suspected violations. It can be a grower, geographic area, or country. There are some import alerts that are specific to a country, like countrywide import. So anything coming from uh, China, there's an import alert specifically for suspicion of melamine from, from milk products derived in China. Um, so that would be countrywide. It can be a history of non-compliance with good manufacturing practices. Uh, it could also be the previous FDA collected samples, tested it, and found a confirmed violation. So you're added. And this is, again, it's all published on the FDA's website. Um, so once you're on the red list, uh, is it possible to be removed from the red list? Yes, it is. And you can go to a green list. And we will talk about the green list in the next slides. Um, but you can get off the red list. Um, so it's going to be the international manufacturers that are listed on these lists. Um, there are steps to be removed from the list. As a third party lab, we do not help with the petition process. So you would file a petition with FDA. Um, you have to do a root cause investigation to determine the cause of the suspected or confirmed violations. You want to have corrective actions in place showing that you can prevent future contamination events. Um, you'll have your processing documents. 
you have to have a minimum of five consecutive non-violative entries, and that is where your third-party lab does come into play. They are the ones that would provide these private lab packets. So you have to have five consecutive, essentially clean entries that come into the market in the US. Um, there might be an FDA on-site inspection that has to occur, and there could be additional steps required to be removed. So a green list, um, this is ultimately where you'd wanna be or have your manufacturers. Um, so green list is a list of firms and their products that have met criteria for exclusion from detention without physical examination um, under specific import alerts. So same as the red list, this is published, it's included on the import alerts. So in this case, these, these particular manufacturers from China, they had been removed, it shows the date that it was updated. So January 18th of 2022, this particular company was removed and added to a green list, and it is for breads and baked goods. Now, it doesn't mean that other products that they would bring in might not be placed on detention, but this particular commodity of breads and baked goods most likely will just uh, be released into commerce after FDA has reviewed it. So what happens when you do have an FDA detention and this happens? It's, it, it can be scary. Um, your supply chain is frozen. You can't do anything with that commodity once it's placed on detention until the FDA has made a ruling if it can be released or not. So now you have a challenge. You have warehouse costs that are accumulating because you did not plan on having that product sitting there. Um, buyers are shorted. You're not able to fulfill orders uh, because, again, you're stuck waiting for a decision to be made on the FDA's part, whether to release or reject the entry. Um, when you do get detained, you'll have a notice of action that's issued. It lists out the individual items in a shipment. Anything suspected to be in violation will be listed as detained. Uh, the notice of action will also include the reason the product's detained and which import alert that it might be associated with. And you will receive a respond by date on that notice of action, which is a date that you have to submit your testimony if you want to overcome the violation to the FDA. And the third party independent lab is the source of your, your written testimony, which would be in the form of that private laboratory packet. So we're going to dive more into, into the whole FDA process. So an FDA notice of action, this is what it looks like. Um, seems most of you on this call have, have seen these, you're familiar with them. Um, your broker or, or yourself will receive this notice of action from the FDA. It's gonna give you an entry number, has some other entry details. Most important, it's gonna list each one of your line items that you have that have been imported, and it's gonna give a status of detained, release, under review. In this case, this one's detained. As you scroll down your notice of action, it's gonna break those individual line numbers down and it's gonna tell you why that specific line item was placed on detention because the different items may be on detention for a completely different reason from the other. So in this case, we had tuna. It was detained uh, under import alert 1681 for suspicion of salmonella. We had a respond by date of September 19th. So that's the date that you have to have data into the FDA. It's also going to include compliance officer that is assigned to your entry. So you'll have that compliance officer's name, email address, and a phone number if you have questions to reach out to them. So now that you have this FJ detention notice of action in your hands, you have a decision to make. Now what do you do? Um, you do have choices uh, once it's under detention. Um, big question usually is, does this line item have value um, to me or my company to be considered for release? So, um, you know, yes, I need this product. I've promised this to a client. It's a huge value shipment. Um, we need to have it. We have confidence from our supplier that it's, it's clean, it's fine. Um, I do need it. So in that case, you need to contact a third party lab um, that has FDA detention um, capabilities so that they can arrange the sampling and testing of the product meeting all FDA regulations so that they can submit the testimony on your behalf to overcome any suspected violation. Maybe the shipment has no value to you. It's just not worth the time, the aggravation. It's, you just, you don't wanna deal with it. It's too small of a shipment. Um, maybe you were suspicious to begin with if it would have an issue coming in and now you've seen FDA does have suspicion. It's not worth your time. Um, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to test it. You can take no action 
and the compliance officer is going to issue a refusal once that respond by date comes. If you don't do anything to it, um, they would issue the refusal and then you have to either destroy or re-export that shipment because it will not be allowed into U.S. commerce if you make no decision and don't move forward. So if you do decide to move forward and continue on an FDA detention resolution path with a third party lab, there are certain steps that need to be taken. And we're gonna dive deeper into each one of these and drill down the process, but just to give you a broad overview of what the process is, it's going to begin with a sample collection. Um, again, your lab or a third party sampler is going to do this for you. There's specific processes that have to be followed. From there, they're gonna do a laboratory analysis at the third party lab that you've chosen. A lab data package is going to be compiled by the lab and with your permission, that would be submitted to the FDA. At that point, the FDA is going to review the package and make a ruling. They'll decide to either release or reject the entry based on the data. So before you contact this, your third party lab, you wanna have important documents at hand and these are documents you will have anyway regarding the shipment. So your lab's gonna require these documentations. The first one is your notice of action. That's obvious, it lists the products in your shipment, states the line status, if it's released, refused, pending, FDA's sample collected or detained the product. Um, it's going to include your compliance officer who's assigned to the entry and then that respond by date, all critical information for your lab. They will need the bill of lading. It's provided from the shipper to the importer of record, it includes your shipping costs, co-signee, port of discharge, country of origin, and place of delivery. Your customs form includes all details of inbound shipments, and that comes from your customs and border protection. Commercial invoice will give us the dollar value of the goods in the shipment. Sometimes it'll give us pack sizes. Uh, uh, sorry, packing list, that'll list your pack size for sure, and lot or production date codes, uh, case counts, and then a warehouse tally, we need that for maybe pallet counts. Uh, well, obviously we'll need a warehouse address, contact person's name, final case counts, warehouse lot numbers, if any. These documents are critical for creating a collection report to collect samples and a sampling plan. These are also documents that the FDA requires be included in the private lab packet. So once you've received a quote for your for the testing and the sampling um, and you've, you've decided to proceed with it, your third party lab will begin the sample collection process. Sample collection is probably the most important step of an FDA detention. If samples are not collected correctly or documented correctly, the FDA will stop the review process when they have that final packet and say these aren't, doesn't matter what your results were, what your analytical data shows, samples weren't collected correctly, it's the data is null and void. So this really is a critical piece of the entire process. So sample collection provides valid testimony to the FDA. The shipment, the samples must be collected from the detained shipment that's physically in the United States. You cannot have samples sent from the manufacturer directly. It has to be that shipment in the US. They have to have access to the entire shipment when they're collecting the samples. And there has to be traceability and a documented chain of custody. At, you wanna provide transparency and integrity of your lab data and the packet to the FDA. Um, so details and integrity are key in this collection process. So we prepare a collection report, which defines a clear sampling plan for de the detained line, the physical documentation of the sampling, and it contains all relevant details for the FDA. This process will also include a photo report. When your sample collector is at the warehouse, they take photographs of the, sh the whole shipment. They take photographs of pallets. Uh, pictures of the individual cases that they open and collect samples from, the individual samples that they've collected, the final box that they've packed it in, the shipping label, it's all very clear for the FDA so they can see exactly what was collected, where it was collected from, um, the cases and pallets are all labeled. So if FDA were to go back to the warehouse to collect an audit sample, it is obvious which pallets were opened, which cases were opened, and all of that has to be transparent to the FDA. If you end up needing to destroy your shipment or re-export it, you have to be able to account for all 
all pieces of that shipment. So if samples are missing because the lab collected them, you need to be able to show the FDA and have proof and evidence that this is why these particular cases are missing. They were sampled and here's all of our documented evidence of that. Um, samples are shipped to the lab using a traceable carrier. So typically FedEx or UPS. Um, and the inspector maintains custody of the samples until it's delivered to a shipping facility. Um, and as I said before, the entire shipment has to be available to the sampler. So here you don't wanna be moving product um, to different warehouses because the sampler would have to be able to go to every one of the warehouses to show that they did have access to the entire shipment. So once the samples arrive at the lab, they go to um, or once they arrive, they go for analytical testing. This, you want to make sure you choose a lab that's knowledgeable in FDA detention. There's a very specific set of protocol and methodology that would have to be used. Um, it has to be recognized, approved. Um, a lot of them have to be validated methods, and it has to be matrix-specific validated methods. So it can't just be, oh, we're validated in seafood for antibiotics. It, it has to drill down into shrimp, tilapia, crab, validated like very specific so make sure the lab that you choose um, is familiar with that and has those processes in place um, once the analysis has been done the coa is sent to the client you get to review that ask any questions that you have and with your permission the fda private lab packet will be submitted to the fda you do not have to submit the results or the packet to the fda if you choose not to, then the entry would be re refused um, because you did not provide the adequate testimony to overcome the violation. These laboratory packets are, are large. They're usually about 100 pages or more. They're going to include all of the sampling documentation, the photographs, collection report, um, as well as analytical documents that are produced for the analysis. It'll have technician CVs um, at the lab level. There'll be training files included. So it is a, a huge amount of data that goes to the FDA. So it's very different from just a routine COA you might receive um, typically for, for normal routine shipments. So submitting just a COA to the FDA will almost guarantee a, a refusal. You have to have this entire packet. So um, just a short offering of our capabilities at Mary U. Um, so we have a, a lot of analytical tests that we offer just for routine testing in chemistry and microbiological testing. For FDA detention, however, because there is so much of this documentation that has to happen, specific validated methods that have to be in place or recognized methods, um, this is a, a, an over, overview of what we would offer in chemistry and micro testing. We also have the unique capability of these expert services for FDA detention. So we do decomposition analysis, and that's with a specialized team certified specifically in seafood decomposition. Um, and then we have our, our compliance team that can do label reviews or nutritional facts panel generation. Um, but again, it's really important to make sure that the lab you choose has these validated methods and a team in place that's familiar with FDA detentions and the process behind it. So the final lab data package submission, if you decide you do want the results in the analytical packet to go to the FDA, your third-party lab will electronically upload this to the FDA via their ITAX website. Um, as the importer, you would have access to ITAX as well. You will probably be in there a lot uploading um, documentation to the FDA. You can see line status, um, but the third-party lab is the one that has to upload that final packet to the FDA for their review. This packet also includes an importer statement that you as the importer would have to fill out. It is a legal document. Um, it, the critical piece of this document is that it, it's gonna ask how many times the line has been sampled and tested and you as the importer have to answer that truthfully. Um, if you choose to not submit a packet because you didn't get favorable results and you choose to have that, that entry resampled or retested, you have to disclose to the FDA how many times you've had that sampled and tested and it is a legal document. Um, 
one piece to go back on that one, the, there's also a director statement that gets included in these in these laboratory packets. That's from the lab side. So if the lab is the one, the same lab does the testing of these entries multiple times, if that is what you've asked, all of the data associated with that entry is going to be submitted to the FDA. So if you had it sampled and tested twice, the lab is going to share and submit all of the data from the first and the second set of testing. So it's it's a, a lot of transparency with the FDA. They have to know everything that happened with that entry. So both the lab and the importer are signing legal documents stating how many times they've sampled and tested an entry. So once this packet's been uploaded to ITAX, the FDA gets to review this um, and then determine if they want to release or reject it. So if the FDA reviewing analysts or the compliance officer have any questions, they'll go back to the lab, either usually directly, sometimes they'll go back to a broker um, and ask questions. The lab will then respond accordingly. Um, the compliance officer does the initial review of the packet. They're making sure that specific documents are included in the packet. Once they approve it, it will go on to the FDA lab analytical team to review the scientific piece of the data in the packet and then goes back to the compliance officer for their final decision to release or refuse. So if it's released, that's great. <clears throat> You're going to get a notice of action stating that the line item is now released and you can move the product into commerce. If it's not released and they decide to refuse it because it's violative, um, then the product cannot enter U.S. commerce and you have 90 days to either re-export under FDA and, and Customs and Border Protection Oversight, or you can destroy the shipment. So uh, key takeaways from this whole presentation, um, <clears throat> FDA has that authority to inspect and detain shipments um, under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, and then it's great to be prepared uh, to respond to this if you do get a notice of action. So planning ahead, review the import alerts. Those are published, they're available to everybody to look at. You can look through them if you're looking to source maybe a new ingredient or work with a new manufacturer. You can look uh, on these import alerts and if you find them, you can be prepared either ahead of time knowing, okay, the shipment will most likely be detained, I'm ready, um, or maybe choose not to not to import it, but at least you're, you're prepared. Um, you can reference the red and green list, see who is listed on there, select a reputable third-party lab with FDA detention capabilities and knowledge. And you're gonna to wanna to keep the shipment intact until you make a decision. If you're moving it around uh, to different locations, different cities, it's broken apart, it's gonna be a lot harder for accountability to the FDA, whether you choose to have it sampled and tested, or if it ultimately has to be re-exported or destroyed. You have to account for all of that product again. So that can get expensive um, if you're moving it around and having to move it back. Action items for this, make sure you collect those important documents that we mentioned, the notice of action, commercial invoice, packing list. Those are all documents you would need anyway, but your lab will need them to review the entry. Contact a third party lab, um, request extensions. So we mentioned the respond by date, the date that you have to provide testimony to the FDA. You can request an extension. So you don't generally receive a lot of time to respond to these notices. So there is the opportunity to request an extension from the compliance officer to get more time for the lab to collect samples, do the testing, um, for you to move product if you need to, to a warehouse. And compliance officers are generally um, willing to grant those extensions with reasonable reasons. Um, when you get your COA, make sure you review those results and you understand them and the implications that they will have if you submit to the FDA. Make sure you sign that importer statement. Um, FDA, that's one of those documents they look for in that private lab packet. And then you wait patiently for the FDA to rule um, and make sure you keep that shipment intact until the FDA has made a decision to release or refuse. So All thank right. you. Everybody. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Annie. Um, for your informative presentation. So we did get tons of questions um, in while you were presenting. So we'll go ahead and move on to our Q&A session. Um, there is still time 
uh, for you to submit any questions you like during the Q&A session, just go ahead and submit those in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so let's get started. Let me pick a question for you here. Um, so our first question, and I'll just kind of go down the line. Um, are importers notified when placed on the import alert list? Uh, yes, you will be notified. It'll be uh, in your notice of action, I believe. You'll be issued a notice of action because typically the FDA will have sampled and tested a, a shipment. And so you'd have a lab report and data supporting why they put you on the red list. All right. Um, next question we have, are all import alerts entered into the red list? Or what? I'm sorry. Are all the import alerts entered into the red list? Um, so each import alert will have a red list or might have a red list. Some of them don't actually have a red list included. So it's not a red list with import alerts listed. There are individual import alerts by number within each import alert. So the import alert 9919 from the session, which was specific for salmonella, for foods suspected of salmonella contamination, that import alert will have a red list associated specifically to that import alert. So it'll be a red list for foods under suspicion of salmonella. I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> All right, so our next question here, does Mary U Nutrisciences work only with foods under detention? Do you also get, do, you also test or help with medical devices such as examination gloves? Um, no, we are not set up for medical devices. No, we do foods, we can test cosmetics, um, dietary supplements, but not medical devices. It's just a specific set of, of instruments that we don't necessarily have. But we're happy to review any, imp or any notice of action you receive and our team will look it over and make a decision if it's something we're able to do or not. And we can always suggest another lab if it's something that's outside of our scope of capabilities. Thanks, Annie. Um, once we are out of the red list, do we automatically go into the green list or do we have to ask the FDA? Um, you have to petition with the FDA to be removed from the red list. So being removed from the red list is outside of our scope of what we offer. So I, I do not know for a fact if you're off the red list, you're automatically placed on a green list, but I would have to assume that would be the path that is followed by the FDA because you do petition with FDA to be removed. So they are the ones, FDA formally removes you from the red list. So I imagine you would be placed on a green list. But that is a great question that I'm not 100% positive if it's automatic. Okay, uh, next question we have here. Um, can we go ahead to dump the detained product while we get the alert, or do we have to wait for the FDA to issue the refusal document? Um, okay, so I think I understand the question. If, if we received a notice of action saying it's under detention, can we just go ahead and export or destroy the shipment before we take action with FDA? Um, I would communicate with your broker and your compliance officer to make them aware of your intention of the entry. I would not do anything until you've communicated it with the FDA. All right. Um, and then we have, um, uh, does Mary Unit Sciences have sampling staff available in proximity to import locations to enable proper sampling for for us if necessary? Um, we do. So we have a network of trained samplers and they're available nationwide. So it depends um, on the port, on your warehouse location. So we can usually sample from probably 80% of the locations that have been shared with us um, for warehouses. So the best thing is just to reach out to us, let us know your warehouse location and we can let you know right away if we have a sampler available for that area. There have been times that depending on the location, we have samplers that will fly to a, to a warehouse. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Annie. 
And I'm still getting tons of questions coming in during the Q&A session. So I apologize if we don't get to everyone during this time, but just a reminder, we will follow up with your question um, if we don't get to it. Um, but our next question here is, in the documents listed on slide 21, is the importer of record is the importer of record the importer for customs purposes or as defined by the FDA as part of the foreign supplier verification record? Is the importer of record, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, so is the importer of record the impor importer for customs purposes or as defined by the FDA as part of the foreign supplier verification record? So importer of record is the, yeah, importer of record is going to be the person that is respons taking responsibility of the shipment coming into the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. Or the, I'm going to go back to my slides here on my, to reference how you're, how the person asking this is asking the question, um, excuse me for digging through this. Um, the under FSBP, the importer of record is the one responsible for the shipment. Um, so this is going to be your, so we talk about the notice of action, bill of lading, oh, bill of lading provided from shipper to the importer of record. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the person responsible for the document under FSVP. All right. So let me read this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what if you're outside of the U.S. shipping food samples into the U.S. for analysis? These samples do not have commercial value and aren't for consumption. Why do they get stopped by the FDA? Um, so if you don't file an FDA prior notice, notifying the FDA ahead of time that you're going to be in, or exporting product into the U.S., they don't know it's coming. They have no idea what it is. It might be flagged. Um, or suspicion of a violation, maybe your manufacturer listed on a red list or coming from a country of concern. But if FDA doesn't know it's coming, they're surprised and caught off guard. And sometimes, I don't know that they always will detain it, but they will. It, the process is slow to release it um, into the U.S. But it's important just to mark it's it's of no commercial value. It's laboratory samples, not for human consumption on your shipping records. Um, and we always advise, or I I always advise um, filing a FDA prior notice to let them know that you are shipping these samples to the U.S. so they're aware of what they are. Good question. Um, so our next question here are, what are the typical reasons for being placed on the red list? Um, it's, it's really, it's gonna be information or suspicion of violations. So it might be that, um, I mean, FDA randomly does check shipments. So it might be you're the, I don't know, every 1,000th shipment get stopped and looked at by FDA. It might be that yours was that lucky number. They pulled sample, tested it, and it happened to be positive for, for something, a pathogen or a pesticide, whatever they, they chose to test it for. Um, that's going to put you on the red list. It could be that you're um, a manufacturer in a, a country that's had some um, suspicion or confirmed violations in the past. Um, it, it, there's usually a pretty good reason, just, just history of violations or suspected violations that FDA is aware of. Uh, next we have here, is there a particular method to collect the number of samples from the whole lot? Um, specifically like two five gram samples per 50 kilograms of the product or? That's an excellent question. Um, so FDA does have a very specific sampling protocol that would need to be followed based on the specific import alert. So the amount of samples we collect for pesticide violation versus salmonella is very different. Um, and that is all spelled out by the FDA. They have guidance documents um, that are available. Again, this is published, um, it's public knowledge. You just have to know how to dig through it and find it. Um, and so we would collect it based on that. If it was pesticide, let's say, we collect 10 sub 10 subsamples. Um, that is by a lot or a date code. So if you have multiple date codes within one line of product, we have to break that into individual lines. So if you have two date codes, that one line has now become two lines because we have to sample and test from each of those date codes individually. 
um, and there's a specific weight of sample we would collect. So pesticides, maybe we collect one pound um, of sample for each of the 10 samples. So we have 10 samples, and then we run that as a single composite. So we're not running 10 individual analyses. And that's all spelled out when you when you reach out to a lab or to us for your quote for a specific um, import alert we would break all of that down in the quote, the number of samples we would collect, which is um, dictated by the FDA. Great question. They all have been. Yeah. Um, so we have another one you did mention about asking the FDA for an extension um, of the respond date. So this one is under what kind of circumstances will the FDA deny an extension of respond by date? Um, I can only speak to the experience I've, of what I've seen. Um, so, it, mm -hmm. so it's again, it's a lot outside of my scope being that I'm not FDA, but what I've seen is they have rejected extensions if you're on your second or third, I mean, you're, you've already requested a, an extension and you've received it. Now you're asking for a second extension, a third extension. If you don't have really compelling reasons for why you need that extension, like some real hardship, why you haven't been able to get this done in the amount of time required, that's when I've seen FDA um, reject an extension request. So some of them will say like, this is your second and final, I don't care what happens, you're not getting another extension. Um, and it might be, you've just, you know, you're just not making a decision. FDA, FDA has to keep moving on these. So I've seen them reject it usually after a second or third request, um, but usually they're fairly reasonable. Um, there's times where just sampling Sampling just can't get done quickly. Maybe your warehouse just isn't able to accommodate us. So FDA is pretty reasonable with granting extensions. Great. Um, next question here. If the lab test testing result is not a good one, can we um, can we not submit the results to the FDA and wait for them to send us the refusal document? Or do we have to let the FDA know that this product is no good? Um, no. So if you if you test the product and it's not favorable, you do not have to submit the results to the FDA. Um, in the eyes of the FDA, not submitting results is just you haven't proved testimony showing that it did overcome the violation. So that is why they would automatically issue a refusal for it. So while you're not confirming that, yes, it is positive, they don't have evidence to prove otherwise. So they would, I mean, they come to their own conclusion, but they would refuse it. But you don't have to share that COA unless subpoenaed by law. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then our next question here, does this laboratory need to be FDA LAF accredited or just ISO 17025? Um, that's an excellent question. And that actually leads into the kind of the future of the FDA, which is exciting for us. So um, I'm gonna kind of break this down and maybe answer questions that weren't asked, but um, what we used to hear a lot is, you know, are you an FDA approved lab? I heard you have to be FDA approved or, you know, lab XYZ is FDA approved. Um, there had never been such a thing as an FDA approved lab. So FDA doesn't endorse labs. They, um, what they're looking for is that your lab provides the documentation and analytical documentation in that private lab packet showing that they know what they're doing. They have approved methodologies that FDA recognizes. Um, that A lot of that is changing now. Um, FDA has been introducing um, this, this LAF program. So what they're doing is the idea that you would kind of streamline um, FDA or labs, independent labs that are doing FDA detention testing. So what LAF is saying is that you have to have an accredited body and the FDA has designated which accrediting bodies they will consider. That accrediting body has to accredit your individual private lab to be LAF accredited. So um, that's saying that you've gone through particular trainings to have yourself accredited. So uh, Mary Yu, we're A2LA ISO 17025 accredited. We actually just received our LAF accreditation, which is exciting. Um, so we've got that. It is not uh, required at this time by the FDA that you have a LAF accredited lab do your FDA detention. In the future, it will be. They don't have a start date yet that I'm aware of. I believe they're waiting to make sure they've got enough private labs that are going to apply for this accreditation. And then once they have a, 
I don't believe they gave us a number. They just did a, a webinar on this exact topic. I don't think FDA designated like 50 labs or 10 labs, but when they reach a number of reasonable labs that are LAP accredited, they will then say this is required and there will be a six month grace period to get on board with a, with a LAP accredited lab. So in the future, that is going to be critical if you wanna resolve your detentions. But we're excited, Mary U is, is, is LAP accredited. So um, soon here, FDA will have that published on their website too. So it's all very transparent. You'll be able to see the list of accredited labs. Awesome, thanks, Annie. Um, moving on to our next question. So we have one here. What happens if the packet is refu refused because information is missing from the packet? Do I still have to destroy or re-export? Generally, no. So if your lab packet is missing data or, I don't know, chromatogram scans blurry, the FDA is going to go back to the lab and ask for clarification or for these missing pages. So they're not going to just refuse it immediately. Mm -hmm. There'll always be a little bit of communication back and forth um, with the lab to rectify that. Okay. And then what is the process for removing old, um, let's say from two to three years ago, import alerts? Um, so it's going to be going through that petition process. So you'd have to start uh, importing commercial size shipments to the U.S. again um, and have at least five consecutive clean shipments come in. And when you've got that, you can begin the petition process with the FDA to be removed from the list. Yeah, it doesn't matter how long ago you were added, as long as you start that petition process and have those five consecutive clean entries. And then I think we'll just take a few more questions here um, as we get closer to the time. Um, let's see. Uh, is there a dashboard that it's possible to check all import alerts or only, or is there only the list? Um, well, okay, so FDA has a, on their website, you can, you can just Google search like FDA import alerts. And you'll see maybe one that's a number come up 99 something or 45 something. Click on that one. And at the top, you can see where you can actually sort these import alerts by industry, by commodity. You can just look at all of the import alerts by number, and it's going to give you all the import alerts listed out. Or just search FDA import alert and just make sure you go to an FDA.gov website and you'll find them all. All right. And then. I think we'll just take one more question. Um, oh, I just had it one second. Oh, there's so many on here, <laughs> which is good. We love questions. Yes, we do. Um, okay, if See, I'm trying to find a really good one to end our session with. Um, okay, um, that's this one. So if our product was intended for a different market but was repacked and entered into the USA, who was responsible? It was our name disclosed to the import alert. Can you repeat that question? So it says, if our product was intended for a different market, but it was repacked and entered into the USA, who is responsible? I'm assuming if it gets detained, um, since it was repacked um, and entered in the US. I, I wish I could talk to the person who asked the question to make sure I answer it correctly. I'm going to, I'm going to use an example. I don't know if I'm, I hope I'm addressing the question. Um, um, so let's say for example, you, um, you're a manufacturer based in China, you manufacture chocolate, chocolate cookies. I don't know, cook, chocolate cookies. Um, but you're sourcing your chocolate from the Netherlands. Um, so your chocolate's made in the Netherlands, you've imported the chocolate into China, you're using that Dutch chocolate in your product, and then now you've shipped it under your company name to the U.S. The, because it's a, 
milk, if it's a milk chocolate, if it's a chocolate product, the FDA is automatically going to flag you because you're importing a milk derived product from China, which is a countrywide import alert because of melamine. So now your shipment's been stopped, even though the chocolate didn't come from you. I don't know if this is answering the question. Um, you can present an argument to the FDA if you have documentation saying, hey, we did the, the chocolate's your concern. The chocolate did not come from China. It was not manufactured in China. It was manufactured in the Netherlands. And you have your documentation proving that. You can share all of that with the FDA and the compliance officer um, as evidence to say, hey, we're overcoming the violation because the chocolate's not even from China, which is your concern. And usually that evidence, that, that's your testimony you're providing instead of a lab test, um, the compliance officer may favor a rule in your favor and say, okay, that's reasonable. No lab testing required and we'll go ahead and release the product. So hopefully I answered that question. I think, so. I think that's what was intended. <laughs> but okay, I think um, we're at a good place to kind of wrap this up. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you Annie um, for being our expert today on our webinar. Um, really great Q&A session. Again, if we didn't get to your questions during this session, we'll definitely follow up with you um, after the webinar. Um, but again, thank you for coming. We really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Um, and just as a reminder, you will receive a recording of the webinar within the next few days. Um, thanks, Annie. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank Have you, everybody. Weekend. Thank you. Thank you.